Thank you. Thanks a lot for coming. Uh, my name is Philip, and I will talk about generalizing spatial relations with end-to-end metric learning. This is joint work with um, Andreas Eitel, Nicola Abdo, and Rolf Bogart from the University of Freiburg. So we hope to deploy robots in our domestic environments, for example, to tidy up objects into such a shelf. And one important concept that we humans use to structure our environments are spatial relations. So we want to be able to demonstrate to the robot how to put an object next to another object inside this shelf instead of having to manually specify where to put this object. So this means we need to equip the robot with an expressive representation of spatial relations. And then there's a the question, how can we do this? And what would this model of a spatial relations look like? And to get a better intuition, let's take a look at a few examples in this shelf. While there are few relations you can come up with very quickly, such as an on top relation, so as between those two brown boxes here, or a next to relation, such as between the red boxes, or an object inside another object, there are relations that do, do not directly think of, I'd say, such as the relation between these two sieves, or the relation of this paper roll hanging on the board. So that means the challenge is, so it's impossible to, to pre-program all these things because you, you definitely will forget some. So the challenge is to find a model for relations that is able to learn all arbitrary relations and that can handle all kinds of objects of various sizes and shapes. And another thing we need to consider is that the robot should act in your environment. And now, for example, consider that the robot should manipulate this blue box to be in the hat box here. And what would you say, how many different relations are on this trajectory? So we argue that spatial relations are continuous, and we therefore should find a continuous model for relations. All right, so we're going to tackle the problem of learning um, to predict the similarity of relations. So for example, when we have these two scenes given here, we want to predict how similar are the relations contained in them. And the second thing that we want to be able is to imitate relations. So, for example, if we use the scene on the left as a reference scene, we want to be able to transform the poses with, um, of the objects on the right such that they imitate the relation in the left scene. So, for example, like this. And with our approach, the robot is able to imitate a demonstrated scene. So we demonstrated a scene here which is uh, on the bottom, the coffee cup and the brown box. And the robot should imitate this with the two wooden boxes. And as you can see, it successfully does so, even though uh, the, the shapes of these wooden boxes are completely different than the shapes of the objects in a demonstrated scene. And as you can see, this works for different relations. So what has been done previously? Well, there are a few works that pose this as a classification problem. So, for example, Rossmann et al. and Kulik et al. both design features and then train a classifier on them. And the problem here is that we need to learn a new model for each new relation. And whereas our approach here, we learn one model that then captures a continuous spectrum of relations. And this is closest to the work by Mies et al. And they were the first to propose to learn a continuous model for spatial relations in the form of a distance metric function. However, they relied on hand-engineered features, which you can see on the right here, uh, on which they learned their metric, and they used a sampling and grid search based technique to imitate relations. And we overcome these limitations by training the distance metric end-to-end, -end, removing the need for manually designing features, and by, um, by proposing um, a principal gradient-based approach. So, to um, just summarize these con contributions here, again, we're learning this end-to-end, -end, so we don't need any expert in the loop to predict the similarity between relations. And the second thing we do is that we propose an intuitive approach, which is based on the gradients, um, as we have a continuous representation here, to imitate spatial relations. So how does this work? Um, as I said, we want to learn a distance metric. This means we have two scenes as input and we want to output a distance that approximates the similarity. So for example, given these two scenes, we want um, our metric to output a small distance as the contained relation here is very similar. So both scenes contain a somewhat on top relation. Whereas 
for dissimilar relations, as for example, the scene on the left compared to the scene on the right, we want the distance of our metric to be large. And we follow other metric learning approaches in that we don't output the distance directly, but rather learn a transformation function into an embedding space in which then an existing metric approximates um, then the similarity. So this is depicted here exemplary with the black arrows. The black arrows represent the transformation function. And the nice property of this is now that we can um, use this formulation and the problem of imitating a relation can now be formulated as one of minimizing the distance between two scenes under the learned metric. So when we bring the scenes closer in metric space, the more similar the relation becomes. So for example here, when we want to generalize or to imitate the relations on the left with the objects on the right, we just need to bring them closer together in the embedding space as depicted here by updating their poses. And ideally we end up with these objects representing the demonstrated relation. How can we do this? As I said, we want to do this end-to-end, -end, so this means we take the point clouds of the objects as input, and to reduce dimensionality, we project them to three orthogonal planes to obtain depth images, which we then, uh, which we then feed into a neural network which computes our embedding. So what we see here is the transformation function part of our metric. And then to train this metric such that it has the desired properties, we use a weight sharing convolutional neural network. And the idea here is that we want to pull together similar scenes and to push apart dissimilar scenes. So for this, we clone this transformation function three times. And one of the instances gets the reference scene as input, which is depicted in this picture here in the middle. So the middle is the reference scene. And then we present another instance of the network, a similar scene, similar to the reference scene. And the last instance, so the similar scene is on the top, and the last instance represents the similar scene, which is on the bottom here. And then we compute for each of these scenes the corresponding embedding, which is these here, so the three boxes on the right. And now we can compute the distance between the embeddings of the similar scene and the reference scene and the dissimilar scene and the reference scene. And with a contrast of loss function, we now achieve the goal of pulling together similar scenes, so we minimize the distance, and by pushing dissimilar scenes towards a margin of one, so the distance between dissimilar scenes towards a margin of one. All right, and having learned this metric, then there's a question how we can evaluate it. And as it's a metric, we can compute the nearest neighbors based on the distance in our metric. And we compute this exemplarily here. So on the left in the video, we demonstrate a reference relation. And on the right, you can see the um, scenes that we retrieve, so the five nearest neighbors we retrieve with our metric from the Freiburg Spatial Relations data set, which we use for training. And we can now compute the three or five nearest neighbor accuracy. That is, we count a retrieval as successful if at least three out of these five neighbors are labeled as similar. And with this metric, we improve upon the previous results which relied on hand engineer features, which in turn then suggests that we can now leverage this learned metric to also imitate relations with new objects. And to do that, the idea is to keep the network where it's fixed, that is, we don't change the transformation function or our metric anymore, but we insert transformation parameters for the scene that we want to optimize. So here we want to generalize this, the relation of the scene on top to the objects that we see on the bottom. And we, for the scene on the bottom, we insert these transform parameters. And then we compute the forward pass, so this means we compute the distance between the two scenes. And now, remember that we can formulate the problem of imitating a relation as one of minimizing the distance. So all we need to do is to minimize this distance, and we can do so by backpropagating the error through the network, through the projection layer, up until the transform parameters and update them accordingly. Something like this, so here we update the transform such that the object is on top of the other object. And really the cool thing about this is that we have these tools anyway because we need them for training the metric. And this is similar in spirit to other approaches that use the backward pass for inference such as adversarial attacks, but the difference is that we go beyond the image input. So usually they only back use the, the backward pass up until the, to the image layer. And we here go beyond the convolution, which is where the title comes from. Now, 
let's take a look at a few results. So here, we, on the left, we have a scene that we want to use as a demonstration, and on the right, we have a different initial scene which we then, which, with which we want to imitate with these objects, the relation on the left. And as we use backpropagation, um, we use an iterative optimization scheme. So on the bottom diagram, we have the steps that we take over time, and on the y-axis, we have um, the distance according to our metric. And when we now start optimizing, we can see as the distance drops, the more similar the two relations get. And as we approach, as we converge, we can see that the relation on the right is similar to the relation on the left, some inclined relation. We also evaluated this approach on completely unseen objects during training. So this is the famous Utah teapot on the Stanford Armadillo. And we just used those as an initial scene and optimize them to also have this on top relation. And as you can see, the teapot is successfully put on top of the armadillo, despite the fact that these objects were not used during training. However, one problem is that we can get stuck in a local minima um, during optimization, which in turn means the relation is not successfully generalized. And another thing we need to consider is that we didn't account for physical stability. So what can happen is that the embodied spatial relation is successfully imitated, but the underlying scene is not physically stable. So for example, in this case, the blue box that we see here is tilted, and this scene would collapse if it was a real scene. So now we can evaluate this approach online. So here we use vision-based 6D pose estimation to uh, obtain the transformation for the point clouds, which we then project to the depth images, which you see below here, and then feed through our network, compute the distance between the reference scene and the scene on the right, which is the generalized scene. And as you can see, as we move the object on the left, so the reference scene on the right, we successfully generalize the scene to these two new objects. And as this runs online, we can also do this on the Prior 2 robot. So what we do here is a similar setup. On the left, you can see our demonstration and the corresponding projections. And on the right, on the top right, you can see the generalized, um, the generalized relation with two different objects. So the two objects that the robot has in its hand. And now here, our generalization put this successfully inside the box. And then we use the move it library to compute the inverse kinematics and the trajectory to actually manipulate the objects such that they um, are in the desired poses, in the computed poses. So to conclude, we have proposed a novel approach that um, enables robots to have a continuous representation of spatial relations. And for this, we only required point clouds and similarity labels as input, so no manual feature design is required. And the nice thing about this continuous representation is then that we can use an intuitive gradient-based formulation to imitate spatial relations. And our code will soon be available at the given website. And with this, I'd like to thank you a lot for your attention, and I'm happy to answer questions. Any questions? Thank you very much for your talk. You, you haven't said anything about the training requirements, size of the data set that, that you used, and time taken to train, number of objects, number of uh, relations that you used in training. Could you elaborate on that for me? So the very good question. Um, the data set is rather small. It contains 540 scenes, and they are classified. So what we first do is we um, set the simil so we compute similarity labels out of that by saying if they are in the same class, we label them as similar, and if they are just in different classes, we label them as dissimilar. And with this, we obtain um, a lot of combinations of these different scenes. Um, however, there's also only 25 objects in there, so I guess results could probably be improved if there's more diverse objects in there. And regarding training time. Um, so the data set comes with 15 splits, as it's rather small. So to train all of these splits takes a day, but a single model takes um, to about two and a half hours to train. As we do all of the computations, we construct the scenes online on the GPU. 
and do all the depth projection also on the GPU. I have a quick question. So how much do you think would it improve if you would just feed in the 60 post vectors, for example, of the two objects involved? I'm not sure whether that went through the microphone. But how much uh, the results might improve or get more robust if you just add the 60 post vectors of the two objects? Because you already estimate those, it seems like it. To be honest, I think it would get worse. Um, because what we observed is that um, we, um, at least we, these 60 poses don't capture things like um, hollow objects where we co can put objects inside. So I think this would just not be captured anymore. And I don't think that then only 60 poses would have, at least for these relations, the same effect. Okay, thanks again.